Let's welcome Dr. Patton. Look at these beautiful faces. First and foremost, I want to thank God for making this day possible. Director, uh, Mr. Hawkins, other coordinating staff, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak at this amazing event. I am truly honored and I am definitely humbled. Mr. Thompson, I want to thank you again for that wonderful speech. Can you give him another round of applause? <laughs> I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join in this Black History Month celebration. Just think, nearly 100 years ago, we didn't have Black History Month. We had Negro History Week. And it took place during the second week of February. And the reason why the second week of February was chosen because it coincided with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. It wasn't until 40 years later that Black History Month was proposed by black educators and students at King University, the Black United Students. And that, my friends, are part of the reason why we're here today. On this day, we celebrate African Americans in a time of war. During this celebration, I am supposed to share part of my story and give you some little history that happened while I served in the military. But this is much larger than me. I'm just a small sample size of a much larger picture. Entering the military 13 years after Mr. Thompson, I am a byproduct of his career. Sir, for your service and dedication, I sincerely thank you. This moment is more about the foundation and rather a brick and a wall. I am just a brick and I will share my story, but it will be intertwined with the foundation that led me to be standing here at this very moment. As we all know, there was a time African Americans were not allowed to serve in the military. And when they were, they were segregated and ostracized. The Buffalo Soldiers were a Negro cavalry created in 1856. I cannot imagine the adversity they faced in the 1800s. But what I do know is they were faced with racial prejudice from other members of the U.S. Army. Not only did they have to deal with hate from fellow service members, they were constantly attacked by civilians in the local areas where they were stationed. Before the Tuskegee Airmen, no African American served in the military as a pilot. Tuskegee Airmen conducted 1,500 combat missions and saved countless lives. For their actions, they received various wars of valor. But despite their success, there were still many who felt they were not worthy because of the color of their skin they were still discriminated against both within and outside of the military. With the beginning of World War II, African Americans would get their opportunity to join one of the most elite fighting forces in the world, the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> I'm not biased. <laughs> <laughs> they would get their chance, however, they were not allowed to attend boot camp alongside their white, white counterparts. Instead, they were sent to a small camp in North Carolina called Mumford Point. Despite their success, they were still not allowed to do the jobs that would allow them to maximize their full potential. And as mentioned, we all know segregation ended for the armed services in 1948. But that did not put an end to segregated units and African Americans were still ostracized to include members of my own family. I come from a long line of military men. Both my grandfathers served in World War II and fought on Normandy. My great uncle, original Mumford Point Marine. Both my father and uncle served in Vietnam. And the thought of me carrying on that legacy to join the Marine Corps or the military for that matter was non-existent. I was not even interested. I was not influenced to join the military until I was 17. My influence to join the Marine Corps specifically came from this young African-American kid who was only 14. See the faces? His name was Dan Bullock. And although he was 14, he had the heart of twice the men his age. Now, I personally never met Dan, nor have I had the opportunity to speak with him. But God works in mysterious ways, and he was still my biggest influence. It comes from a time you least likely expect and from a source you've never anticipated. 
Dan was from North Carolina. And he lived there to the age of 12. And once his mother passed, he moved to Brooklyn to live with his dad. At the age of 14, he altered his birth certificate to depict he was four years older than he really was so he can enlist in the Marine Corps. September 1968, Private Dan Bullock went to boot camp. In May of 1969, he landed in South Vietnam to help defend this great nation. And however, on June 7th, 1969, he was killed in an attack by the North Vietnamese Army. He was only 15. To this day, he's still the youngest service member to lie, die in the line of duty. And needless to say, his story had an everlasting effect on me. I went to boot camp September 13th, 1988. Nearly 20 years to the day that Private Dan Bullock went. Compared to the Buffalo Soldiers, the Muffer Point Marine, and the Stagig Airmen, by the time I joined, things were different. But please understand, discrimination and racism still existed. I shared a room with two other Marines. And above my rack, I had a 16 by 20 frame portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was so profound, so defined. When you stare at it, you get lost in thought. So I went away for the weekend and came back. And as I entered my barracks room, I noticed something was different. I didn't know what it was until I looked above my rack and realized my picture was gone. While I expressed my frustrations, one of my roommates laid in his rack in silence until he felt my frustration. Then he told me another Marine had taken and burned it. I knew what I wanted to do, but I know what I needed to do, and I did the right thing. The next day, I told my platoon sergeant what happened, and I was dumbfounded by his response. First, he laughed, and then he told me, ah, don't worry about it. I'm sure they didn't mean anything by it. Being a young African-American kid who grew up in the streets of Detroit, I was completely out of my element. So I had to find the silver lining in this and take the high road. From that experience, two things happened. The platoon became divided, and the African Americans formed a bond, and to this day has yet to be broken. And that was nearly 30 years ago. And if any one of us are ever in need, we will do whatever we can to make sure the others are taken care of. Yes, I lost the picture. The person who stole it from me did it out of hate. But what he didn't realize, he created unity through adversity, and for that, I'm gratified. And when I think about that experience or other similar moments, I think about how bad those who came before me had it. The hate, the segregation, the simple thought of being looked at and treated differently just because of the color of your skin. The notion of being viewed as ignorant and incompetent when their intellect was either equal, if not greater, than those judging them. They were categorized as a black race because many felt they were not worthy to be considered a human race. And if I knew if they could persevere, so could I. I went to combat in 2009, Baghdad, Iraq. I was a Marine attached to an Army unit. And my job was to keep them safe. <laughs> and I did just that. For nine months, I kept them safe. And for my actions, I was awarded. My accomplishments were nothing in comparison to those who laid the foundation before me. Take Augustus Wally, for instance, born in 1856, at a time when the United States considered African Americans property. But freed at the age of nine, he joined the U.S. Cavalry at the age of 22. While serving in combat, he unselfishly saved the life of another soldier while almost giving his own. For his actions, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award. And there's many other stories of African Americans performing well in time of war. Some were rewarded, some actions were noted but went unrecognized. Of the 3,500 Medals of Honor awarded, less than 90 went to African Americans. During my military career, I faced a lot of adversity. But through it all, I definitely have been blessed. In October 2015, 
I retired from the Marine Corps after 27 years of honorable and faithful service. If I could turn back the hands of time to 1988, I wouldn't change a thing. I would do it all over again. Each experience to include the adversity is part of my DNA. It is the true makeup of who I am, and it will lead me to my next step, which is federal government. And I was told that trying to enter federal government can take a lifetime. We all know. Being retired six months, I finally started to work. And I owe that to the path that was created from my life experiences. But I also owe appreciation to the leadership at the Irish Directorate. They took a chance on this Marine veteran with no prior federal experience, and I am forever grateful for that. I was asked, once I leave this earth, how do I want to be remembered? If someone were to walk through a cemetery, what would my headstone read? It would read, he persevered and he died empty. I hope those who knew me would say, despite any obstacle that's placed in front of him, he persevered. Despite the times he wanted to quit, he persevered. Despite the times he was told he couldn't, he persevered. With all his blood, sweat, and tears, he persevered. He gave all he had until he had nothing else left to give. He died fulfilled. He died empty. Before I close, I have a favor to ask. Of course I do. I ask sometime this evening you take a moment out of your day and think about the struggles and pains of African Americans. No matter how horrifying, it's a part of our history. Emmett Till was 14 when he was killed. It took over 60 years for his accuser to admit she lied when she accused him of an egregious crime he did not commit. Wilbur Jones, who in 2017 walked out of prison after 50 years after being wrongfully convicted of a crime he did not commit. But please also think about the success and the progress. Kathy Williams, the first African-American female to join the Army. In 1866, women were not allowed to serve in the military. Using an alias, William Cathy, she posed as a man and enlisted in the Army and went to an infantry regiment. There she served her country honorably and faithfully. Little did she realize she created a path for other African-American women to follow, such as Lillian Lee Fishburne, who became the first African-American rear admiral nearly 120 years later. Then you have other great stories, like Guy on Bluffer Jr., a retired fighter pilot who became the first African-American in space. You have Christina Hopper, the first African-American female to fly a fighter jet in combat. And you have people like Colin Powell, the retired Army four-star general who became the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are just a few who made history, but we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Be proud of any African-American who accomplished anything. It can range from something that's owning a small business to being the president of the United States. And the beauty of it is, it's just not black history. It's American history. Thank you.